Good morning. Oh, all right. Welcome to our Sunday service, Unitarian Universalist Church of Augusta, August 29, 2021. Today's service will be by our new Reverend Nick Filson, titled Expectancies Effects. Good morning. I'm Barbara Bowen, your church treasurer, and I have a few announcements. First off, welcome to our visitors. If this is your first time for our Sunday service, uh, please fill out the blue card, which I should have brought up with me, but you'll find one in the pocket in the chair in front of you, and leave it at the visitor's table down the hall. And if you're comfortable doing so, please rise in body and spirit, or spirit, and tell us your name so we can welcome you. The reopening team continues to monitor the increasing numbers of the COVID Delta variant in our area. Everyone participating in indoor church activities and services over the age of two must wear a mask and practice social distancing regardless of vaccination status per CDC guidelines. There will be no eating and drinking indoors at this time. We ask the individuals who have COVID symptoms or are otherwise not feeling well to please refrain from entering the church building and are encouraging e-attendance through Zoom. We've also made the difficult decision to suspend congregational singing at church services until further notice. The social justice team will meet today after the worship service. Contact Reverend Kim or Natalia Bowden for information. The meeting will be in person, but can be hybrid if requested. The UU meditation group meets on Mondays at 7 p.m. on Zoom and at the church. To attend online, contact E. McNabb or Melanie Roberts. Chris Garcia is the contact person for the in-person gathering. The Family Ministry Program is still seeking volunteers at various levels. Please contact Reverend Kim Miner for more information. Thank you for your ongoing commitment to the success of the Family Ministry Program. We're also looking to hire a paid nursery worker we need a child care professional to staff the nursery during Sunday services. This person cannot be a church member. Please contact Marsha Worst if you know of a candidate we should consider. The worship team is still seeking collaborative and co-creative people to join this integral team. Various levels of commitment are possible. If you're interested in being part of shaping our lives together here, then this could be a great fit for you. Please speak to Reverend Nick or Jezebella Knapp. And as always, remember to take a look at our weekly e-announcements and the UUCA public calendar for details and contact information about other upcoming events. Thank you. Hi, I'm gonna read from a poem called Wake Up America by Muslim Girls Making Change. September 11th, 2001, wake up America, the enemy is here. The terrorists, the jihadists, those Arabs, the womanizers, the monsters, those bin Ladens, we are the ones to watch out for, to surveil, to remove, to attack. But actually we are the advocates, the award winners, the bilinguals. Hello, hola, bonjour, guten tag, Assalamu alaikum. We're the 4.0 students, the honor roll students, the star athletes, but we're also the misunderstood, the ones to watch out for, to surveil, to remove, to attack. This morning we won't be uh, we won't be doing the congregational singing, but David will be uh, leading us in singing. and And all you people who like to meditate, you can you can like uh, visualize yourself 
you know, singing the words to the hymn. So the opening hymn that you can visualize is number 1053 in the hymnal. Now is that time in, in our service where we take a moment to return to our bodies, to the present, to the now, to each other, in a time for prayer and meditation. I encourage you to close your eyes, have your feet on the ground if you'd like, whatever makes you comfortable in this space, and open to these words. It is so difficult to see this flower because the countless others we've seen before cloud the view, along with how we expect it to look and how it might be improved. Even the faces of the ones we love deeply hide like buried treasure behind histories of expression. In order to see what is right in front of our eyes, we first have to recognize we have gradually become blind and then begin the slow work of forgetting.
will lead us in our joys and sorrows. Good morning, everyone. This is contingency. Edest quod edest. It is what it is. Uh, contingency isn't a word you hear much associated with an interior life or a spiritual practice, but it is under the surface the driving force of religion and spiritual practice. Contingency is all that all right. stuff that hits you that you weren't expecting. Like, why do we have to wear masks? Why? That's contingency. Because we had a plague that nobody uh, planned for. People expected it. They didn't plan for it. Most of the stuff that is going on right now in the year 2021 is stuff that the science fiction writers that I loved when I was a kid did not expect or anticipate. Zoom, computers, microphones that don't work. Patience when things go wrong. Right outside that door, right there, there is a hallway full of cardboard boxes of books. They used to be our church's library in the minister's office. It's your library, and now it's waiting for what? Bookcases, bookcases cost money. You see where I'm going with this? Yeah. You either donate them. Thank you to the Denisons for donating a bookcases for our, our little library out there. Book lovers like me are waiting to get at it. Bookcases cost money. Why are we not, why can't we have some of Liz Goodson's cookies with coffee in the common room like we used to do where we had our classes and stuff? because we had a wall full of water that nobody knew about. That's contingency. It's not even a question of poor planning. It was out of left field. Nobody expected it. That's why people turn to God. That's why people turn to philosophy. That's why they turn to religion, because of contingency and how you're going to deal with it. The nice thing about money is that it's real, and you can deal with it. The other stuff that happens to you, you can't deal with. The stuff that's happening right now to people in Plaque Mines Parish and Iberia Parish and Lafouche Parish and all these Cajun parishes I used to love and hang around in, it's not just their houses. The world that they knew is about to be ripped off the face of the earth. That's contingency. That's what religion is for. That's what spiritual families and communities are for. That's why you need to take care of this. Yeah, we need bookcases. Yeah, we need to fix the wall. And you know what? Sometime between now and next August, a whole lot of crap is going to happen that we don't even know is coming. And it's not because you're sinful or God loves you or doesn't love you. It's just because that's the world that we're born into. And we need your help to take care of contingency. And now's your chance to do that. Will the ushers, if any, contingency, please come forward.
So I'm not taking my mask off for a, a variety of reasons today. But I am going to take my jacket off because I am way too hot. So I appreciate your grace in that. So today we're going to talk about the underbelly of expectations. It won't, be, it won't be quite as rosy as my previous couple of sermons, though hopefully you'll still get what you need from it today. Sometimes our expectations can have a negative impact, especially when it comes to putting other humans into a monolithic box. By, by monolithic box, I, I mean assuming somebody is going to be a certain kind of way because of one or more of their various identities. In other words, profiling. In my last sermon a few weeks ago, I spoke about how, how playing with the story we tell about ourselves can have a liberating impact and, and allow us to be in better relationship with others, uh, particularly when we're, when we're working with uh, with a therapist through those stories. Well, when we tell ourselves stories about others and we, we make them stuck in place because of those stories, that can be way more damaging, both to the person in the false narrative and to me, to all of us, to the, to the interdependent web of existence. And if, and if we're in a position of power or authority, acting on and retelling those tired old stories is akin to sin. Actions of separation. Evil. Today, we're going to discuss expectancy's evil effects. Who here has heard of implicit bias? Okay, good, good chunk of folks. What about, what about on Zoom? Who here has, has heard about implicit bias before? Raise, raise your hand if you'd like. A few folks there, good. Well, if you haven't heard of it or, or need a reminder, according to Mazarin Banaji and Anthony Greenwald, who formulated the term together in 1995, implicit bias refers to attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious way, making them difficult to control. Charlotte Rule from uh, simplypsychology.org explains implicit biases emerge because humans have an unnatural tendency to, to find patterns to help, quote, navigate the overwhelming stimuli in this very complicated world. We make up patterns in our mind, otherwise known as stories, so that we're not constantly trying to start each situation from scratch. It's a, it's a, it's a, in many ways, it's a healthy mechanism to help us make sense of the world. In many ways, it's not. The more destructive implicit biases often emerge from external stories. Rule continues, quote, culture, media, and upbringing can also contribute to the development of such biases. The stories we hear over and over about a group of people can really impact our preconceived notions about everyone in that group. Either way, we're battling against tired, old, harmful stories, usually authored by folks who have power and want to keep it that way. Expectations can have damaging side effects. A simple example of implicit bias is with a food many of us have had at least once in our lives. Uh, when I say peanut butter, what's the next word that comes to mind? Jelly. The story we've heard over and over most commonly is that peanut butter goes with jelly. So our mind fills in that blank with that word somewhat unconsciously. 
But of course, we know that there are many other good choices to go with peanut butter, especially for those who have allergies. The story isn't universal, even though it's told the most often. Many people, shockingly, don't even like PB&J. Talk about sin. <laughs> now, credit to New York Times and PBS for this excellent analogy from their, their Who Me biased uh, video series. I invite you to look that whole series up on YouTube at some point. It's, it's really great. A negative example of implicit bias at work is when a white person locks their car doors while stopped at an intersection because a black person is walking near them. The white door locker probably doesn't even think about it before doing it, hence the un unconscious action. The fictional story that somebody who is black is a threat while near your car has been told way too often in TV shows and movies and other mass media, and therefore people have it ingrained as truth in their thoughtless mind. That seemingly simple reaction of locking one's door and the clicking sound that goes with it can be damaging. It can be experienced as a serious microaggression toward the black pedestrian. It causes harm to somebody who probably experiences that kind of behavior and harm far too often. And when those experiences pile on top of each other, the recipient can very easily feel beat down. Expectations can cause pain. In her article for the Utney Reader, entitled Great Expectations, Studying Expectancy's Effects, Jessica Cohen shares the story of a psychologist whose research was seemingly ruined by unheeded expectations way back in 1956. Uh, she says, quote, Robert Rosenthal bumped into the complex and far-reaching power of expectations in 1956 when he thought he ruined his doctoral research. For his PhD thesis in clinical psychology at UCLA, he aimed to find out whether people project disappointment with themselves onto others. However, the subjects randomly selected for a disappointing experience on a test showed a significant difference from other subjects even before the test. Rosenthal realized he must have made a mistake. I made them different before the experiment, he said. That was spooky. Knowing which group would fail when he first met them, he had somehow contaminated them with his expectations without knowing how. How often do we contaminate people with expectations without knowing how? If a person who comes from a marginalized identity starts believing the stories they constantly hear about people who look like them or uh, have their same identity, they can, somehow, they can somehow contaminate themselves with these expectations without knowing how. If a black male teenager is constantly hearing that this one story is how he should be in the world, he may be more likely to act in that way. The implicit bias is turned inward. This amplifies the feedback loop of pain, suffering, and oppression already encircling him on a day-to-day -day basis. At Walmart the other day, a black woman was checking receipts at the, as folks left the store. She checked all the receipts of the black people leaving in front of me. When she got to the last person before me and was about to check the receipt, she looked at me and said, oh, you can go ahead. I didn't move. The person whose receipt, whose receipt she was now checking said, oh, she said you can go on. I reluctantly passed. This kind of embodied story is a little different from other stories we tell ourselves. This is a systems issue that will take far more change than a good relationship with a therapist, though a relationship with a therapist would certainly still have benefits. <coughs> stories are powerful. Expectations are powerful. And we must wield them carefully. My white realtor visited my original house three times without supervision. Now 
comes in and out and out, and each person is for a variety of help and help. If you see a well-dressed white person walking into a house, everything must be okay. But you black folks walking in, there must be trouble. Must have some scolding. Does it need to be louder? Uh, check, check your uh, light and see if you're not transmitting. Is the battery not working? I don't know. That's what I'm talking about before. Do they sound like they're turning on the battery? It seems to be off. Will you do it? I'll use this. I apologize to the folks. I apologize to the folks at home on Zoom who haven't heard much of it or any of this. I don't know when I stopped transmitting. Uh, I will make a, a copy of this sermon available online if you'd like to read it. And of course, um, well, I don't know if any other mics are picking this up for the Zoom broadcast either. So we'll make a copy of this available for folks. Zoom is doing fine. We're good on Zoom. I'm glad I took my jacket off because I'm really sweating now. <laughs> we'll just use this. I don't want to deal with it again. Stories and the way they're told which depict, depict a black man as savage and violent are perhaps the most insidious. On Monday, I got stuck in the string of videos that automatically play in Facebook after, after I clicked on the one video I, I actually wanted to watch from a friend. This, this itself is an example of how the powerful have the ability to, to frame narratives, how they, they force the stories on, on us, thus amplifying their viral reach and impact. One of the videos that popped up was from an episode of a, a Real Stories episode. Real Stories is a documentary series, I, I guess, that, that tells dramatic, sensationalized stories. This particular episode portrayed vicious killers who escaped from prison. No need to say anything else about it, except though it included some, some white guys in the reenactment of the folks who escaped, they only did scary exposés of the serious crimes committed by the black escapees, the, the reason why they went to prison in the first place, perpetuating stereotypes of the dangerous black man. Though there were some black correctional officers depicted in the reenactment, all the correctional officers interviewed were white men. They call it a documentary, so it must be truth. This type of sensationalism is even worse when it's wielded as a weapon by a politician. George H.W. Bush, I don't know if you remember this story, used Willie Horton's image to help him defeat Michael Dukakis in the waning days of, of his election, helped him win. A perfectly timed dog whistle. 45 used this kind of dog whistle all the time to create uh, great and terrible impact, firing up his base constantly, infamously saying, quote, when Mexico sends its people, they're not sending their best. They're sending people that have lots of problems, and they're bringing those problems to us. They're bringing drugs. They're bringing crime. They're rapists. And some, I assume, are good people. That's from Time Magazine in 2015. So how do we break out of these patterns? How do we move through this? How do we stop this kind of story from being so insidious on all of us and having the worst impact on those of us with the least amount of power in the system? How do we change the expectations so that we have a different set of effects that more closely resemble justice, equity, and compassion in our relationships? Well, the main thing is to tell different stories, a lot. Being careful not to begin telling a new story over and over again, which would just replicate the old patterns. This requires hearing from as many different people as possible. This requires hearing from as many different people as possible and the different stories about different people as possible. Prioritizing 
new stories told by and about the folks who have experienced the most pain from expectancy's evil effects. Changing the narrative, just as we sometimes need to change the narratives we tell about ourselves, but on a much larger scale. On an individual level, we need to constantly be examining our own biases. There are some great online tests that help to unveil folks' implicit, bi implicit bias. Uh, look up Harvard Implicit Association test on Google. You can al also take the more expansive IDI test at IDIinventory.com. Let me know if you need help finding those resources. I'll point you in the right direction. Knowing more about ourselves and the stories that are unconsciously brewing in our minds that have, that have a real world impact on the way we behave toward others is very important. It's crucial because it begins to change the narrative. It adds complexity and nuance to the story. And it takes, it takes it out of the hands of the folks who tend to dominate those narratives. This can only be a good thing. This revising of narratives, both internally and externally, is a spiritual practice. It brings us closer to wholeness as individuals and as a community. It brings us closer to wholeness as individuals and as a community. And it's incredibly liberating and empowering. Renowned indigenous storyteller Thomas King says, quote, all we are are stories. Reshaping a story changes you. It changes the world. Let's change our expectations so that the effects serve liberation. And may this transformational work move us ever closer to beloved community. Are you hearing this? Okay, good. We come from the fire, living in the fire. Go back to the fire, turn the world around. We come from the mountain, living on the mountain. Go back to the mountain, turn the world around. Whoa, so is life. Ah, so is life. Whoa, so is life. Ah, so is life. Do I know? See we one another clearly Do we know who we are? Do you know who I am? Do I know who you are? See we one another clearly Do we know who we are? Oh, so is life about a while so is life. Whoa, so is life about a while. So is life.
Today's closing words are from Dreams of the Compass Rose by Vera Nazarian. All stories have a curious and even dangerous power. They are manifestations of truth, yours and mine. And truth is all that wants the most wonderful yet terrifying thing in the world, which makes it nearly impossible to handle. It is such a great responsibility that it's best not to tell a story at all unless you know you can do it right. You must be very careful, or without knowing it, you can change the world.